to their futures Soldiers speak out 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 Welcome to the Veterans for Peace Hour. We're pleased to be here again this month at the Thurston Community Television Studio. Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109, the Rachel Corey Chapter, brings issues to the viewing audience, and audience made up of veterans especially, uh, of topics that are important to them. Tonight, we have a very special uh, treat in mind uh, because we have roughly 200,000 veterans that are in our prisons or jails, and many of them are there because of issues they received when they were involved in combat. And we are going to see more of these veterans returning to our area who are suffering from the effects of war. And one of the issues that we're trying to see is, is there a better way to take care of these veterans other than incarcerating them? We have a, a host, uh, and I'd like to introduce Jody Mackey. And Jody went through some very special training, and she got excited about restorative justice. But then what makes it more special tonight is we have one of the experts. And I'm going to let you introduce our, our guest, Jody, and tell us why uh, we're talking about this tonight. Jody? Thanks, Dennis. Last spring, I heard about a restorative justice class that was happening. And one of my passions is creating peace in this world, and it's why Veterans for Peace is here. And so I went to Beth Rodman's class. It was two days, and I walked out completely inspired and completely feeling as if I could use this technique in the world to create more peace. So tonight we have Paul McCold here, Dr. Paul McCold, an international expert on restorative justice who moved to Olympia almost two years ago. Thanks for being here, Paul. Well, thank you. So, tell us about restorative justice. Um, well, I've been involved now with restorative justice and these ideas since um, I got my PhD in uh, 1993. And, uh, and once I learned about this, I had uh, any other interests I had in criminal justice and studying the criminal justice system was really overshadowed by these powerful new ideas. <laughs> I had, um, throughout my education, learned all of the things wrong with the existing criminal justice system, but what was really lacking was some positive vision about what else we might do. And so it wasn't just enough to know what was wrong and not working. It was important that we um, actually figure out some other positive alternative for this. And so um, I ha at the time was in Philadelphia. I um, visited with the American Friends Service Committee's national office. I met with uh, Linda Thurston, who was the national director for the their criminal justice program and told her I'm a new PhD, I want to change the world, uh, I'm interested in, uh, in reform of the criminal justice system and I'm here to get your advice about where to begin. Uh, she handed me a book called uh, Changing Lenses written by a Mennonite named Howard Zare. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and that book just uh, really changed my view of, uh, of what's possible and stuff and so that was how I got involved in restorative justice. So here we are tonight in the Veterans for Peace Hour, wondering how restorative justice can work with veterans and what's happened to them. Well, Dennis, I believe, mentioned how many veterans are in jail right yeah, now. Yeah, at any given time, uh, there's maybe a half a million people that are homeless, and then some of those homeless people uh, move to being incarcerated. And uh, according to some of the records we've been reading, uh, 200,000 some veterans, and we're seeing now 
of returning veterans from both Iraq and Afghanistan that when they leave the service, they have multiple issues, including uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. And not having that adequately treated uh, can lead to them um, getting in trouble with the law, and then that leads to uh, incarceration. And that's where your criminologist uh, background comes in mind, but also where restorative justice can have some impact. At least we trust that it can. Yeah, well, that's certainly possible. Um, we've been trying to promote this both nationally and internationally, and it seems that the, uh, the rest of the world has really woken up to restorative justice now. There's a number of countries that are using this as their primary approach to the criminal justice system. Primary uh, approach. Primary approach. Um, Canada uh, and the United Kingdom have both adopted this as their main approach. Uh, of course, Australia and New Zealand have also adopted this. New Zealand man has mandated this as the primary approach for all of their juvenile justice systems and cases since 1989. Every case uh, for juveniles except homicide is being handled through a restorative conference uh, where the families are brought in and encouraged to participate. So um, that's, uh, and as um, I can show, also the United Nations has gotten an interest in this and a number of other countries around the world are doing this. I think the U.S. has fallen far behind. Some of our um, get tough policies and this sort of uh, uh, political uh, fear mongering that uh, we've seen in this country has really, I think, held us back and we're at least 10 years behind the rest of the world in really developing a uh, uh, significant restorative justice effort here. So maybe this is the time to say, what is restorative justice and restorative conferencing? Um, okay, um, so if we could switch to uh, the PowerPoint here, I'll talk a little bit, what is restorative justice? Um, first, begin with a definition that was uh, established, uh, first presented to us when I was with the uh, Working Party on Restorative Justice at the United Nations. Uh, by a, a British uh, fellow from the Home Office, a, a researcher there, Tony Marshall. He uh, defined restorative justice as a process where all of the par parties with a stake in a particular offense come together to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offense and its implications for the future. And so we begin with that as our basic definition that it's a process that it involves all of the parties who have a stake in a particular offense. Now by all the particular, uh, or the parties, what, is, what does that mean? Um, everyone who's been affected by a specific incident, not people who are like troubled because crime exists in their neighborhood, but someone who knew this uh, offender, knew this victim, um, were, observed it, were somehow affected by uh, the event that happened, um, who have a, a stake in, in the outcome of a particular offense. So it's not generalized that way. Let's define this in relationship, say, to a veteran who uh, exits the service at, uh, say, Fort Lewis and then is in Thurston County area, but then runs afoul with the uh, legal system. And who would these parties be then? Well, one of the things about restorative justice is that we don't necessarily focus exclusively on the offender. In fact, restorative justice is as much a process um, to support crime victims as it is to support offenders. Um, but let me uh, proceed with the definition okay. here and flush this out a little bit, and I'll give you a better uh, understanding of the kinds of parties and stakeholders that are involved in this. So, um, so the United Nations in 2002 adopted uh, basic minimum principles on the use of restorative justice programs in criminal matters after a significant international consultation with a number of the countries of interest uh, in the um, uh, Office of Drugs and Crime, um, and then the, promoted that uh, at their International um, Crime Congress, uh, held every five years. The Economic and Social Council of the uh, UN eventually adopted uh, uh, some language, and they defined rest a restorative process. Remember I said restorative justice is a process, as to mean any process in which the victim and the offender, and where appropriate, any other individuals or community members affected by a crime participate together actively in the resolution of matters arising from the crime and generally do that with the help of a facilitator. And so, again, this is really adopting Marshall's definition by and large. And so for me, the stakeholders are the victim, the offender, and the community uh, for uh, the, any given incident. And so we can create a typology of the kinds of 
practices that might be involved or included uh, as a restorative intervention by thinking of these three sets of stakeholders. And so if we overlap them, we create a traditional Venn diagram. Many people learned about that in, uh, in high school. So we have um, victim interests for the crime victim, about uh, reparation for crime victims. And uh, for offenders, it's really about offenders taking responsibility for their behaviors and us holding offenders responsible for their behaviors. And rather than just this vague concept of community, we're really talking about the communities of care, of people who care, know about, love, uh, respect, live with, and support um, victims and offenders in a crime. And so the communities of care, then the issue for them is reconciliation. And so anything that's a program that involves these, any of these three sets of stakeholders in holding offenders accountable, repairing harm to the victims, and reconciling victims and offenders with their communities is restorative. Anything that's not dealing with one of these three issues is not restorative, which is not to say things that are not restorative aren't good. I mean, we need rehabilitation programs, and I think they're very important. I just don't think that we should wait until someone commits a crime to provide um, rehabilitation services. So one of the things I remember that's important about this is in traditional dealing with crime, the victim is not cared for. The victim doesn't have a voice in what happens often uh, around the offender to and doesn't get to share their story in a way that's healing to the community or to and, themselves. And in fact, um, what happens is the professionals, the lawyers, the um, police, the public officials steal the conflict from the victim. The victim is the one who reports the crime, but then after the, they take over the crime, uh, the victim has very little say about what happens uh, in that case afterwards. Um, so in fact, uh, um, one of the, what I think of the grandfather of restorative justice, Niels Christie, said that the professionals steal the conflict. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, the problem is not that we have conflict, it's just that we, don't, we haven't uh, come, become very effective at uh, responding to and, and, and dealing with that conflict in a constructive way. Yes. We tend to do it in a destructive way. Yes. Let me uh, continue with my slideshow here. Pardon me. Um, so for me, any, a fully restorative intervention is one that engages all three sets of stakeholders simultaneously. And uh, some examples of those are family group conferences, um, restorative conferences, and healing circles run by uh, Aboriginal communities and, uh, and can be done in a variety of settings. Um, where it's not possible to engage all three sets of stakeholders, that we have what would, I would call mostly restorative processes that engage two sets of the stakeholders at the same time. And so being, bringing together a victim and an offender and having them meet and talk about um, the issues and how to repair the harm. Mm -hmm. uh, victim offender mediation is a mo mostly restorative pro program. And for until about 1990, it was the only restorative justice program before we uh, developed these other uh, more fully restorative processes involving the families. Also, of course, um, victims, uh, if the offender, we don't know who the offender is oftentimes with many crimes, um, we can engage the victim in a process that's restorative by um, surrounding them by their communities of care in a process that allows the victim to get support and tell their story and um, get some satisfaction by uh, having a, a community that can support them and is helpful in supporting that effort. And then, of course, where victims don't want to participate in a process, um, the offenders can be surrounded by a community of care, of support for them, to hold them accountable and to help them uh, with whatever um, reintegration processes or rehabilitation programs they might need. And of course, uh, originally therapeutic communities in correctional institutions create this artificial community of care around offenders. So those are mostly restorative. And then partly restorative are these programs that engage only one set of stakeholders. So crime services and crime victim compensation programs, victim shelter programs, anything we're doing for crime victims is an important part of restorative justice. Um, and if we only engage the, the victim without engaging their community of care or the offender in that process, then it's a partly restorative. Most of the restorative justice programs in the United States are dealing with offenders only. Um, uh, and those are community, some of the related community service programs that the offenders require to do some service um, related to the offense that they've committed. Uh, youth aid panels, if they really engage the offender in accepting responsibility for their behavior reparative boards, and victim sensitivity training uh, where we engage offenders or uh, young people in prison or jail 
um, about uh, the problems of being a crime victim. And then there's a whole other set of, of possibilities that's not well thought of and is restorative, which is to engage the communities of care of uh, offenders or victims, um, so uh, family support systems for offenders who are in prison, um, uh, and family-centered social work where there's not really a crime that's happened, but there's problems that the family needs to be able to work through more. And so that sort of gives you the uh, whole larger picture of the possibilities for restorative justice, and I advocate always doing the fully restorative approach whenever it's possible to bring together victims, offenders, and the families of both of them to a process where they decide um, what needs to be done now and everyone gets a chance to talk about how they've been affected. Um, and when you can't do that, then you, we need to do something else, less restorative, mostly restorative, where we don't know who the offender is, we still should engage that victim and we should, whenever possible, try to surround that victim with a support system um, that allows them to, to get the kind of nurturing that they need and ongoing support that often we can't afford to pay for with government services. It yeah. seems also, uh, Paul, that the, the role of the facilitator is key in this process in making this whole thing work. Well, the facilitator is responsible for bringing them together and uh, creating a process um, that uh, helps to resolve these issues. It's really the people uh, who are engaged, uh, involved in an incident that actually do the work. The facilitator really, the hardest part of the process is bringing the people all together and getting them to agree to participate. And of course this isn't for everyone, uh, not for every offender or every crime victim. Offenders have to admit what they've done, accept responsibility for what they've done, and be willing to face up uh, to the people they've affected and, and hear from them. So mm -hmm. it, it, can't, it won't work for everyone, and we're not advocating it for everyone, but we could do this an awful lot especially if what we're trying to do is repair the harm rather than seek some form of punishment. Uh, we want to hold people accountable for their behaviors, but we also need to really put the victim back at the center of this process and re-empower victims if we want them to um, recover from the trauma that the crimes produce for them. Yes. And so one of the outcomes that you've seen from this, I've heard, is a decrease in post-traumatic stress. There's been a significant amount of research since uh, restorative justice began in the uh, mid-70s. Almost all, all of the programs that have started have had some component evaluating their, um, how well they're doing, and we always ask victims and offenders and anyone involved whether they were satisfied, whether justice was done. The uh, research we did in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where we had um, trained community police officers to facilitate this process, uh, we had 95% victim satisfaction um, and uh, offenders at 97% uh, satisfied with this. And the few cases that weren't satisfied with the process, didn't feel justice had been done, was because the offender didn't live up to the agreement they made. Mm -hmm. But 94% of the time, the agreement that was produced in these uh, processes was kept by the offender. They make a commitment in front of their families to the crime victim to, to do some acts of repair and so they um, really have a lot of stake in actually uh, following through with that. And so it's been very powerful that way. It's now, a pretty uh, high percentage rate then. Well, I don't know of any kind of consumer product that gets that kind of. Uh, <laughs> so and uh, this was also, of course, being facilitated by police officers. And uh, so it's, you know, it was really a powerful process. And we got significant um, effects, uh, uh, everyone getting a real sense of satisfaction that justice had been done without trying to impose some kind of punishment that wasn't necessary if we're holding people accountable for their behavior to the people they care about uh, and to make it right. And uh, I could um, just say that there's a variety of ways we do these uh, programs and so our, what happens is in bringing all of the stakeholders together, um, we uh, create a circle of people and we create a safe process where everyone gets an opportunity to speak. So a community group conference, um, it's a scripted process. The facilitator follows a series of open-ended questions after introducing everybody and describing the process. Um, they turn to the offender and begin with them, asking for them to tell about what happened. They ask the offender what were they thinking about at the time. And, uh, and then after they've talked about that, they ask, who do they think has been affected by their behavior? Hmm. And it's remarkable how often an offender sitting across from a crime victim says, well, I've been affected. 
And uh, who else has been affected? Well, my mother's real upset about this. When anyone else, I can't think of anyone, in spite of the fact he's sitting across from the victim. So, and we asked then also about how he thinks everyone has been affected by this. Of course, some offenders are more articulate and they're able to um, talk about the crime victim, but they really don't have a clue about how people were affected. Um, and so this, then we turned to the crime victim and asked them, how were you affected by this? Um, this has been difficult. You want to tell us about that? And they tell us um, all of the implications that have happened, how much fear or whatever the implications are for them. They get a full opportunity to completely tell their story and have everyone hear it and have this offender hear how he's affected them. And for an offender to know that, I mean, a young person needs to understand the implications of their behavior and how it's affected people if they're ever going to learn from that behavior. So after the victim has spoken, then we turn to the victim's family and friends and whoever they've invited to come to the conference and ask what they thought about when they heard about this event. And they all share their thinking about it. Then we turn to the offender's family, usually starting with their mother, and ask, we say, this has been difficult for you, hasn't it? And mother cries because really, this, the parents or the mother and the father of the offender are in the, really the most difficult position because they don't approve of the behavior that their child has done or their loved one family member has done. Um, and so they're uh, anxious to express that disapproval um, and, uh, um, and to show that they are, are you know, good, upstanding citizens. Um, and then finally, we um, turn back to the offender and we ask if you have now anything to say to anyone. And that's where the offender then offers a very sincere apology. And for the first time now, they've understood the, how many people have been affected. They didn't realize that before. And then we turn to the victim and ask what would they like from the conference. And it's really up to the victim to begin to set a set of parameters for what they think needs to happen now. And everyone joins into that. And both the victim and the offender have a sort of a veto power over any of the um, conditions of that agreement because it's really their conflict. Um, so that's the way that process works. And then we, um, we draft an agreement of the, all the steps that need to be done. And it's not uncommon for family members if um, the offender has got drug problems, has some other kinds of issues, to say, well, we think he should get in a treatment program or needs to see a counselor or whatever uh, they think is appropriate for that case. Uh, and of course, the offender is asked to, the, if they agreed, is that fair for them? And they are voluntarily agreeing to whatever we, uh, comes out of this. And is we this just, a binding agreement then, Paul? Well, uh, binding agreement, if it's done as a diversion case, it's binding. And if the f offender fails to live up to that agreement, yes. then it's sent back to the court system. So then they do go back to the court system. The, the court system does provide this backstop that uh, we expect um, the cases to be. Uh, followed through on and where they're not. And again, 94% of the time they are followed through on, so it's not been a problem. Um, so anyway, there's a, a variety of other models that we could, uh, I could explain in detail. Um, that uh, the New Zealand has their own model, the, the, this community group conferencing model that uh, um, Jody uh, took um, from my wife Beth this summer is the Australian mo version of the model. Um, there's also a Canadian version of a piece, uh, of sentencing circles that was developed in the Yukon by judges there. Uh, and of course, the peacemaking circles that come out of a Native American and Aboriginal communities, both in Canada and in the US, and particularly the Navajo Nation. Uh, they've had their own independent court system since 1985 and have been using peace circles and peacemaking circles there um, for quite a long time. And those are all very clearly now identified as restorative processes, and uh, we have a lot to learn from uh, the Aboriginal uh, and other countries um, mm. in their processes. The story that I heard about how this got started was that in New Zealand, the native people there said, this traditional prison court system is barbaric. We need to do something else, and we have some ideas about that. And so New Zealand really took this on fully. Yes, um, in fact, uh, part of the problem with the Maori in New Zealand is that they ha are very communal and have a lot of respect and support you know, for them in the Marae their, um, for their, uh, um, their own people in, in that and, what, and their extended family systems in the Marae. And our, the Western version of criminal justice isolates every person from their communities of care and the support that they might be receiving mm -hmm. and 
uh, makes them stand alone, and that really was seen for them as, as barbaric and unfair and uh, inhumane. And I think for, um, especially for like returning veterans, what we need is not to isolate them from their communities of care and support, but in fact, actively encourage and develop uh, greater support systems, em uh, emotional and family support systems and structures, and provide ways to help uh, those families uh, support their, um, their loved ones, especially in times of trouble. But I would like to see that done as a routine basis as part of uh, reintegration of our returning soldiers the veterans be um, create a circle of support and care for each one of them and help them readjust and, uh, and get the support they need to make sure they, they can get the counseling services and that they show up on time and they get the rides or whatever they need to support that. Extended family uh, providing um, connections for the, them to get jobs and for it to really reintegrate. The fact that we have so many homeless veterans is really just a national crime and a shame. Well, you know, historically, uh, Paul, the Greek warriors, when they would come back from, from their uh, battles, would have to be reintegrated into their home society by the older warriors, who were the uh, warrior citizens, if you will. And it was only when the elders uh, deemed that it was appropriate for that younger warrior to be able to be cleansed of the effect that the war had had on them to return to society. And so that kept that person from being a, a menace to society. Yeah, and in fact, that's really the idea. There's two key ideas in restorative justice, and it's really a very different way of doing justice than we have now. Now we concern ourselves with three questions. Mm -hmm. um, who did it? What crimes were violated? And what punishment did they deserve? And we think then when we've caught the offender and we've punished them, we've somehow solved a problem. And in fact, we haven't. We've created more problems for the offender, for his life, life uh, outcomes, for the families of the offenders. We haven't done anything much to help the victim other than to say, here, you get uh, to see some vicarious punishment and won't that make you satisfied? But the victim never gets a chance to tell their story. Often they're not included in any court process if the offender pleads guilty accepts a plea, which the vast majority do, then the victim has really no role uh, in that at all and certainly no, no standing to, um, uh, for outcomes. There's recently been some uh, um, victim impact statements now that are being allowed in court in some cases, um, although the research shows that doesn't really affect the outcome of the disposition of the case much. So, so it's really engaging the, the uh, victim seeking to heal the victim. And so for restorative justice, the three questions we ask are, who's been harmed? First question. Who's been harmed? Who's been harmed by this behavior? Okay. And what are their needs now? Are there victims' needs? The victims' needs, the offender's needs, the family members of the offender, the family members of the victim, the community, everyone who's been affected by this. What, are the, what do they need now out of this? And then who's responsible for meeting those needs? And how, we, how do we go about doing that? So it's really about bringing healing, which is why we call it restorative justice. We're trying to repair the harm that was done. You can't return things to the way they were before, but mm -hmm. trying to make things better and to take into account people's needs can go a long way to pro provide healing for people. And at the same time, it's not soft on the perpetrators, on the people who've done this. There are uh, well, well we yes, our um, experience in the Bethlehem experiment that we ran um, offenders who had, especially those who had been through a court system, um, knew the court system, weren't afraid of it, liked it, understood that, um, and uh, what was fearful for them was to have to face the reality of what they had done, and uh, that was very difficult for them. It's certainly not an easy thing to do, but it's not about being hard on the offender. It's about being constructive with conflicts and problems that we're facing, and so it, you know, if all we're interested is in harsh punishment, the U.S. is number one in harsh punishment. We have a greater prison population per capita than any other civilized country in the world. And, you know, we continue to grow at a rapid pace, even when we don't have the state resources and the tax base to support increasing our government, we continue to put number one priority on locking people in cages. So I, for me, restorative justice is the time, uh, idea whose time has come. It makes a lot of sense, and we can uh, actually resolve problems instead of continuing to add more pain to our society. Yes. Paul, in your PhD studies, it was in criminology. It wasn't in restorative justice. What was the thing, the key that all of a sudden said, I spent all this time 
you know, doing a dissertation, getting my earned doctorate, and this is really what's going to make the difference. Well, I had been looking for something. As I said, I, I knew all about why the existing system didn't work and all the problems, and actually, once you start really looking at the individual stories in any criminal justice cases and stuff, they're just sad and pitiful. And then the system reacts in a way that's like inane and really adding to the harm and not solving any kind of problems. Mm -hmm. And so it was really the search for what else do we do? How do we make this work better when, um, when I learned about restorative justice? So um, let me just quickly um, present here a little bit of the research. Um, so, one of the things that's happened here in the research is that um, there's been now uh, 16 randomized trials, which is the, uh, when you randomly assign a case to either go to a conference, a restorative conference, or to a court system. This is the same uh, methodology we use to test medicines. And so it's the highest degree of, of scientific certainty. And there's now been 16 randomized trials involving some 3,300 criminal offenders and more than 2,300 crime victims, making um, this set of experiments conducted by the Jerry Lee Center at the University of Pennsylvania the largest coordinated program of controlled experiments in the history of criminology. We actually know more about the positive outcomes of restorative justice than anything else, any other intervention we've ever done. Um, and so one of the uh, one of the parts of the study here that this is especially related to the um, uh, dealing with post-traumatic stress. Um, among the randomized trials, um, Carolyn Angel was getting a joint doctorate in criminology and nursing at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, looked at the um, victims of these uh, um, serious crimes that were being uh, diverted to restorative justice cases in, in London. Uh, and she looked uh, at the victims of robbery and burglary. And she found, she had a, a, a test that was uh, able to evaluate their levels of post-traumatic stress and anyone on these tests scoring more than 33 on her, on her evaluation um, was clin clinically having a post-traumatic stress. About one out of five of the crime victims of burglary and robbery in this London study had post-traumatic stress, uh, levels above that. And so she uh, was interested in look, comparing those whose uh, cases went to court versus those whose cases had gone to a family conference. And uh, her results were pretty remarkable. Um, for a single hour intervention, which is this conference, when you bring them together, they last an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. Significant reductions in the level of post-traumatic stress as measured uh, for those who had gone through conference versus a court. And among the um, women who were victims of the crime, the decrease in the post-traumatic stress level was even more dramatic. Um, wow. Highly statistically significant, a huge effect, uh, uh, dramatically reducing post-traumatic stress levels um, for victims of crime uh, in a, with a single hour intervention, not an, an effect you couldn't get with, um, without, with years of uh, counseling and support services. Uh, That's this was incredible. This really very dramatic uh, finding. Mm. And for me, one of the most exciting uh, outcomes that we've seen from restorative justice. So the idea is that this is really good for victims and really helpful for them to, and it's not easy for a crime victim to face their offender. There's a lot of fear and, uh, and anger, and, uh, but when they do, they become empowered, and it really can just shed this, this terrible yoke that they've been carrying of the uh, fear and pain from a restorative justice intervention. So following all of the research, Sherman and Strang, who had conducted most of these uh, randomized trials, concluded from the review of all of the evidence um, that there's now far more evidence on restorative justice with more positive results than there's been for most innovations in criminal justice, any of the other interventions that... Um, scared straight kind of ideas or, you know, mandatory arrest ideas that spread across this country just dramatically and quickly with no evidence or very little evidence to support that they worked. Um, so they also have concluded that restorative justice, no matter how is it, it's, it's measured, is as or more effective than traditional methods of criminal justice, that is the court systems, for reducing crime, that is reducing recidivism, with respect to nearly every group of offender that had been studied. The effects are overwhelming and dramatic. Uh, and so the research on restorative justice is really very clear. Because of this, because it works, it works for crime victims, it works for families, it reintegrates offenders, it builds bonds that they need to mm -hmm. move forward in society. Um, this is coming. It's coming to Washington State eventually. It's a matter of how long this it will take before we begin to take seriously 
another approach here. And so I'm, I'm here advocating that restorative justice happens. We're working as best we can in Thurston County to begin to develop some project. And Jody, you were part of that training for developing this program. And we have an initiative here in Thurston County. Have a lot of interest in, from uh, the government, from legislators, from others. The uh, police chief of Olympia is, is very supportive of these ideas. Um, our sheriff of Thurston County was very supportive. Um, our prosecuting attorney very supportive of these ideas. And we have a number of um, nonprofit community organizations who are now really taking this seriously and beginning to um, train up and get ready to be able to provide these services. So what I would like to see for returning veterans, yes, the idea of this, this possible alternative court system setting that um, under the auspices of the right kind of a court where the court could provide oversight, that we could divert these cases out of the punitive justice system where they're only going to add harsh treatment on top of all of the other painful uh, outcomes that victims or uh, veterans are suffering under, um, and divert those cases to a process where the community can bring together the people who could really make a difference in their lives and support them and provide that kind of care and service for them. So that's what I'd like to see happen, and it certainly makes a lot more sense than taking these guys and just locking them in a cage for a few years and providing almost no service uh, while they're in. Our systems are so overcrowded now. You know, uh, California is under a court mandate to reduce their prison populations by 40%. Um, I don't know where they're going to take all those guys, but um, they are beginning to now take seriously this idea of restorative justice and what we might do with those ideas. So I'm very excited about the possibilities. From me, from, as a criminologist, this is the first really new idea in criminology in a thousand years. We've been doing punishment since uh, we got crimes against the king in England in uh, 1066. Mm. Uh, uh, since then, we've just added on more and more, piling on more and more punishment, as if somehow we could punish our way out of social problems. Uh, and of course, we can't. And it just, you know, it was uh, Gandhi, I believe, who said, an eye, um, eye for an eye will lead to a society that's blind whole world blind. Wow. Paul, when, when you were doing uh, some of your studies, you came across an Australian researcher as well. And uh, how did he influence your thinking? Well, there's been a lot of uh, uh, leaders in restorative justice. Um, John Braithwaite was uh, uh, an Australian criminologist who has really uh, taken us on. He, when I we first got our uh, National Institute of Justice grant to conduct this randomized experiment in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, John Braithwaite had, and Larry, Lawrence Sherman, who had done these other randomized trials, um, were competing against me, had a, a grant application in, and um, we managed to get that, that grant uh, to do this three-year project. Uh, when John Braithwaite heard that we got the grant instead of him, he called up and invited me at his expense. Uh, to come to Australia National University in Canberra to see their project, to learn about their research methods, to look at their instruments, and to do what he could to help support this. What a magnanimous person. Wow. Um, he's written a, a lot about it. He was very interested in uh, broader issues, white-collar crime, regulation of the nursing in, uh, home industry, how these restorative interventions, government could use that to help support um, uh, you know, fairer, more effective regulation of, uh, of businesses and, uh, and other industries. Well, Paul, I knew that this person had an influence in your life, and one of the things that I did was uh, went out and found a, a video that uh, he produced on that, and there may be an a opportunity that we could uh, watch that now and uh, afterwards give some uh, comments on that one. So if that's possible, no, it's not. it think probably not won't be time. possible now. Okay. But what we'd like, I'd like to do is to put the website that's available. John has produced an 18-minute uh, video. It's available online um, that does provide a, a general overview of restorative justice and goes into some of the applications for implications for schools, and uh, they're responding to um, harmful behavior that happens in schools and even extending to um, some of the problems we're dealing with internationally about um, po post-conflict uh, areas and how we might do some peace building. And we had done some work with the United Nations Peace Building Commission trying to get them interested in applications of these ideas. Um, for us tonight, I think the important ideas to think about is how we could 
use this to help support our returning veterans. Absolutely. And, uh, and really deal with some of those issues. And again, as we don't need to isolate them uh, and incarcerate them. That's not going to provide a, any kind of a lasting solution. What we need to do is to surround them with a support system uh, that actually can provide day-to-day -day, uh, support and care for them. And so that's what I'd like to see possible here. Whether what we can pull that off or not is just a matter of political will. I don't think it's a matter of, of costs. It costs so much less to create a, a nonprofit organization and to train them up to do these cases than it does to put one person in jail for a year. Um, we could we could run hundreds and hundreds of these program of these cases uh, for the cost of one what it would cost to incarcerate one person for a year. Yes. Well, this program is produced by Veterans for Peace, which we see as a logical group to become involved in part of this community. How would you see? the Veterans for Peace, particularly this local chapter, uh, becoming involved in, in helping this whole restorative justice movement? Well, uh, there's a number of things they could do. I would think the first thing is to educate yourself about restorative justice, to go to the website that we'll put up, uh, www.restorativejustice.org. It's one of the most um, comprehensive uh, restorative justice websites that are available. Educate yourself about how this is being used um, about uh, different places. Look at the programs that are being run in different states in the U.S. and different cities. Um, and uh, uh, that be begin that with educating yourself and then try to educate our public policy makers about this. Talk to your judges about it. Talk to your prosecutors. Um, we need to create this kind of a program, and we need some organizations that are going to lobby and advocate for it. And that means informed uh, ab about these as possibilities. So I, I would say that's the beginning, is to start to educate yourself about what, what's possible here. Um, and of course, um, after you've looked at this and got some sense of it, uh, we'll continue to try to get things going in Thurston County uh, and see what we can do maybe for bringing this to Pierce County here. Um, I, I know that the uh, Veterans Department of the Washington State is very interested mm -hmm. in pursuing these ideas, and so we'll also uh, the governor's office is interested. As I said, I think that soon the time will be for the legislators to look at this and stuff. So um, I, we need to create a real larger social movement around this, and if we can do it to support our returning veterans, um, I think that's a real possibility because you know it, there's a lot of sympathy that in the public and openness to trying something. Uh, for our returning veterans so that we really can provide them the kind of supports that, uh, that our country ought to do to show the respect and care that they've earned and deserve. Locally, starting in June of, 2000, uh, June of last year, uh, Thurston County began a veterans court and it is filled with uh, a prosecutor and a defendant or a de public defender and a judge that care a lot about the what's happening with the veterans right now with this group that have uh, of veterans who are now uh, enclosed in this court but they do need more people to work with them and I, I could see them uh, incorporating this. Well every veteran, every person in this country comes with a whole support system called families and extended families. Now there may be problems with our families, and we may have done things to sort of estrange ourselves from them, but that's what we need to look and turn to for solutions, not to our government. We need to turn back to the community, back to the people who know and care about us, and ask them for help, and be willing to ask them for help. And then all we need is a little process, a facilitator trained, like Jody, to invite them to come and support the, their loved one, and create a plan where the whole family and extended families can support each other. And I think that's the direction that we need to mo move toward, not more government, more bureaucracy, uh, and uh, you know, not stealing this conflict from the people who own it. Give it yes. back and let's use these problems uh, um, and use the authority of the legal system to interject some real uh, resolution and solutions for, for these returning veterans. I think it's the only humane way to, to resolve this. Certainly know it's coming. Mm -hmm. Now in John Braithwaite's video, there's a story in there that I think is, it doesn't concern veterans, but it might be an opening to talk about how this can actually work. There's a 14-year-old girl who is homeless, and she's a thief, and she has stolen many times, and she gets caught. 
And instead of going through the traditional court system, she is brought into a restorative conference. And in that conference, her mom comes in and basically disavows her, says she doesn't want to be there and ends up running from the room. And you get to see the kind of home situation this 14-year-old girl has. The other people, the victims and the mediator, all a facilitator, all get to see what's actually happened with this girl and what kind of situation she lives in. And they come together to support her. She does have reparations to make. She does get to see her impact on the society, on the victims and the families around her. And then other people step up to care for her, uncles and aunts. And she does have a community of caring that really didn't know the desperate situation she was in before this. And, and this is what can happen with our veterans, too, with a little bit of sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, we have really not explored the possibility of uh, giving opportunities for people who have caused harm, committed crimes, to, to f express remorse for it, to feel badly about it, and to be able to express that. They often do feel badly about it once they have sobered up or once they've had some time to reflect about the effects. Certainly, after hearing about how they've affected their own family members, they feel some remorse about that. And that's, we need to nurture that sense of remorse and responsibility and hold people accountable for their behavior to begin to teach responsibility again. Yes. Teach people how to be responsible and expect them to be. And to provide them the support, the social and emotional support that they need to be able to, to make right the wrongs they've done. And I mean, it's part of um, the 12 steps program of Alcoholics Anonymous that you have yes. to admit you've got a problem and ask for help and begin to look about who's been affected and figure out ways to make amends for that. This is uh, nothing much more than that. It's a simple structured process. It's not rocket science. Um, so that uh, the average person can be trained in a short period of time to, to facilitate this process. And it's amazing how many people are willing when, when they've been nominated as a support person for someone they know, and we call them, we say, you know, John has asked for you to come support them. They're in trouble now, and would you be willing to come and be a support person for John? How flattered they are and how many people will say yes for that. Uh, so that's what we need to do is to surround our veterans with communities of care, circles of support, um, whether they commit crimes or not, but certainly when they commit crimes, it's clear that there's a problem and we need to begin to solve that problem and not just sort of push it under the rug and think by punishing someone we've solved some kind of, uh, provided some solutions. Yes, how do they step back into the community once they've been public punished if there isn't this kind of sharing ahead of time? It's fact, and we know that go, uh, spending time incarcerated can uh, takes away your capacity to really interact uh, in a community in a, in a, in a constructive way. So our recidivism rates coming out of people who have been in prison is I horrific. I was just about to ask you about this, Paul. As a criminologist, um, people that don't go through the restorative justice get incarcerated and they learn how to be a better criminal and do it more successfully, perhaps, and then they leads to recidivism. Uh, what's your take on that as a criminologist? Well, yeah, I think it's less that they're, well, to some degree, um, prisons are sort of schools of crime, but. What we do, do in a prison setting or an incarceration setting, it's a total institution. We take away all ability or dis, uh, of making any kind of choices about life. We take away all the responsibility from an offender when they get up, when they go to bed, what they eat, when they eat, uh, what work assignments. We just we remove all responsibility from them, and we hold them in this dependent, irresponsible condition for a number of years and then send them back to the streets, and we're surprised when they can't cope with uh, the um, demands of our civil societies. Mm -hmm. what, what we need to do is to avoid causing that harm to them by engaging them in a constructive way. Um, you know, I wish our prison systems and our criminal justice system worked the way it was intended, but after now hundreds of years of experience with it and now about 50 years of research with it, it's very clear it doesn't work the way we think. Being harsh on people doesn't cause them to learn the right lessons from it. If anything, it makes them defiant, certainly teaches them how to be more violent. And so we're, we're doing exactly the wrong thing for what people need um, to begin to take responsibility and to learn to live a responsible life. We need to encourage our children to take responsibilities and to give them increasing responsibilities as they grow older and uh, not 
you know, like remove them. I mean, can you imagine if our child misbehaved and we locked them in the room for extended periods of time as a way to help teach them some lesson about appropriate behavior? And of course it wouldn't, and it would do just the opposite, which is what we do with our criminal justice system now. So both of you may know I love stories, and I have another brief story that uh, I think it happens in Vermont. But what happens is that uh, um, some teenage boys are out smashing mailboxes, and they smash a mailbox that was made one year ago by this old woman's husband, and it was his last project before he died. So she wakes up the next morning, the anniversary of his death, to find this smashed mailbox afraid, not knowing why it happened, and in grief. So what would normally happen is she wouldn't get to talk to these young men when they were found at all. But because of this restorative justice conference, they got to get together and she got to express her fear that maybe she was targeted, um, her, her um, connection with these youth as they see what this, what this apparent prank, but this prank that had heartfelt implications for her um, really changed their lives and how they view their actions among the community. There's so. yes, thousands of stories, and we've seen, uh, we conducted about 100 of these as part of the experiments with the police facilitating this process. Um, and every one of them is a sort of amazing story about, you know, what's possible. Yes. And it's uh, always very emotional, but unless we deal with the feelings behind these things, we're never going to solve them. We're never going to repair the harm and we're never going to make things better. We're just going to add more misery to the world. So thus far, what kind of crimes have you used restorative justice with? Have we used it? Uh, in the U.S., uh, there isn't much political will to try this with very serious crimes. There's a sense that somehow you diminish the seriousness of a crime when you let a victim decide uh, what needs to be done to make it right. Um, so it's mostly been used with juvenile cases because we seem to think juveniles still can learn and somehow when you turn 18, you stop the capacity to learn. Mm. Uh, so it's been mostly juveniles. Uh, it's been mostly less serious offenses. There are research around the world where they're doing this with serious crimes and with adults. The research is showing that it's more powerful with crimes of violence because that's, of course, where the harm is the greatest. You saw the reductions in uh, trauma that was caused from the burglaries and robbery cases. Um, so where it's needed the most, that's where we, sh we need to do it more, and we just need political will. I'm hoping, again, because we have sympathy for our returning veterans, and we know they're going to run afoul of the law, that that will provide a political cover for our politicians to try this. Just try it. Let us try this. With, I, some uh, experiment with it and let us even maybe can set up an experiment and do random, uh, random select cases to go to court and actually use science to evaluate how well it's going and then, you know, take it from there. And so this may be an opportunity that we have right now with Pierce County and Fort Lewis and these guys coming back from the Middle East to actually try something really on the cutting edge here and to move Washington State out into the front of the rest of the states in the U.S begin to catch up with the rest of the world for uh, you know, a more intelligent way to respond to criminal wrongdoing. Well, we're in the last few minutes of this program, uh, Paul, and I'd wondered if we could go to the, what specific steps could we do to implement that process? Because we're convinced as veterans that this needs to be implemented, that we need to see restorative justice in this community and all communities, especially if we're going to meet the needs of returning veterans. So what are some specific steps that we could start on at least to get this process going? Well, we have about, from our training last summer, about 30 people in, the, in Thurston County who are trained facilitators now and who don't have any cases to, to facilitate. Uh, so what we need is a brave judge or brave prosecutor who has the authority, the, to dis the discretion, to uh, re re um, divert a case out of that system and give us a chance to try to make this work. We also need some nonprofit organizations who could um, receive those cases, assign them out to the facilitators, provide the oversight and paperwork that we need. And I can guarantee you we will get, we will get much better outcomes than we're getting from court mm -hmm. and 97% victim satisfaction rates. 
we will take care of crime victims and we would never put a crime victim in a position where the offender was blaming them or denying the offense and, uh, and that's a key part of our training and obviously it's been very effective since uh, the research universally shows um, that the victims are getting their needs met here. Now we're talking about criminal court systems. It also works in work situations, it works in schools, it decreases the detention rates and increases the graduation rates and it's... Um, we it's a, need to stop treating people as if they're disposable, yes, yes. and actually uh, care for them in a, in a supportive system. So that's what we get to do with restorative justice. Yes. yes. A lot more implications for it than we've just scratched the surface here. Yes. I want it in every school. Yes. Well, the program that you've been watching on the Veterans for Peace Hour deals with restorative justice, and it's been our privilege to have Dr. Paul McCall share his research, his wisdom, his experience, and if you haven't guessed it already, his passion for restorative justice. The Veterans for Peace Hour will be shown on Wednesdays at 5 and on Fridays at 9 p.m. on Channel 22 in uh, Thurston County. But if you do not have uh, cable access, uh, look for us on blip.tv and then Google for VFP109. That's B blip B-L-I-P dot TV, and then Google it for VFP109, because we are putting the programs that you are currently watching now on Channel 22 on the Internet so that we can expand the information. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you especially for uh, sharing with us, because we really do want to see how we can meet the needs of returning Thanks, veterans. Paul. Thank you. Sure. Yeah.